Hi, how are you? Fine, nice to meet you. You're finally. I know. Finally, after so long, it's great that you could join today. And we're so happy to have like both of you on the call today. So I think it'll be super nice. We're really looking forward Thank to you. it. We're, we're very excited. And we were also looking forward to this, to be stuck and with and I sharing both of our uh, Great. So I think we should just start. Uh, so for everyone who is on the call, I'm the Kita. Uh, I am the co-founder of Zeno Collab. Uh, we are a service design company based in India. Um, and this is our sixth and the last session of the service design halftime series, which we started uh, in the first week of June. This was basically to connect uh, different service designers from different parts of the world uh, who is working in different aspects of the industries and different aspects of uh, who is working in different uh, industries basically and we were fortunate to like speak with very different uh, diverse uh, participants and the, the even experts from different uh, fields so we have had like you know we have two amazing ladies uh, from mexico uh, lucy cruz and lorenza ruiz um, so both of them are colleagues at circlo which is a leading innovation consultancy based in mexico uh, Lucy is a strategic designer there and Lorenza is an innovation strategist and the head of business design. Uh, so welcome both of you and we are really lucky and happy to have you uh, today to chat with us. Um, so just to uh, start, we would really love to know both of your uh, journeys. How did you land up doing what you're doing? How, how has been your journey in Circlo and also know a little more about what Circlo does. So it would be great if both of you could just take it out. Sure. Well, Lore, you, you want to start <laughs> with this? Sure. I'll start with me and then you go ahead with you and Circlo. That we can work. Okay, um, okay. So first of all, thank, thank you so much again for having us here. Um, we're very excited to talk to to a broader, different audience and where we can not only share who we are and what we do, but also what moves us in Mexico City around service design and design strategy and innovation. And I have um, a background in business, international business management. That is um, what I went to school for a long time ago. And um, that um, education led me to a very uh, management business type kind of work at the beginning. Uh, I worked for a couple of years in a multinational company that was starting business in Mexico, which was um, a very big company, but in Mexico was almost like a startup. So that gave me the feeling of um, a startup um, ambient and context, but also with um, international and big corp organization and structure. Then I moved to, um, to a family business. My family has a business. So I switched to that, which was a completely um, different context and kind of work because I was supposed to do um, import and exports and supply chain, but in family business, and I'm sure you all know or have heard of, you do almost a little bit of everything. You end up helping with Facebook, Instagram, coffee, copies, and many things, which... Uh, made me learn a lot about business and about how um, internal organizations work in that sense. And um, it was while I was doing this business that I figured out that I wanted to, um, to mix business and design. Um, I started realizing the power that design could have within an organization and how even though a lot of business don't necessarily know that design is playing an important role within their organization, it's always there and it's always somehow making its voice heard. So that's when I decided to, um, to move on and, and keep on learning. And I went on and doing um, um, a master in design management at SCAT University. And that where um, it completely changed my professional life and my view of the world because I, I finally was able to put words in what design could do and was doing in the world. So I ended up learning about design methodologies, strategic design, service design, 
um, how it connects with innovation and how sometimes it's the same. And um, after my master's, I, um, I started working in Tirklum and I've been there for um, almost two years doing um, in strategic design and innovation methodologies. And in the last year, we, um, we went to um, uh, Duke University to, do a, um, to become fellows of, um, they have a research lab led by Dan Ariely, which is um, one of the big um, reference in people on behavioral science to learn more about their methodology and how they apply it into the world, like real challenges. And when we came back, we started uh, kind of merging behavioral science into uh, our methodologies within Circlo. So we ended up um, doing behavior design and also trying to, um, to make it work for us. So how do we make a methodology that, is, that, it, that it works in books to make it work within your projects, within your culture, within your client's work? And um, that's a little bit of uh, where we are today. And I think we we're going to talk more about it later. Uh, but before that, I, um, I'm going to let Lucy introduce herself as well. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting us, Nikita. And uh, well, I studied industrial design. And in the last year of, of, of university, I, I met the strategic design. And I became in, the, in love uh, with the idea of using industrial, industrial design processes to design something more abstract, like services or experiences. And in, in the last day of, of the university, I, I go with my teacher and I ask her so, um, to become um, that she, uh, that um, I, I don't know, my, uh, I ask her to become my mentor. Sorry for the pause. So during this period of time, I learned a lot actually practicing uh, strategic design. Um, and it was during this time when I met Circlo's co-founder, co so we started the adventure forming Circlo from like, I don't know, since 2012. So at the beginning I started in Circlo, I started doing strategic design and after five years I became the leader of a strategic design team. So I learned a lot about managing people uh, or, and design methodologies. And then, uh, like two years later, I became people director. And as people director, I, I, uh, it has been a stage um, of many learnings because all the learnings doing service design, I transform it to doing service design for Circle Steam. So it's, it, it became really, really interesting for me. That it's a little <laughs> about my, my adventure into a strategic design world. So, yeah. And, and a random fact, my mentor of strategic design now is the um, director of innovation in Circulo. So I think the loop closes here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing to hear both of your journeys because I'm sure it's, you have had like very different experiences uh, mm -hmm. and being part of like a, such a team which is like super diverse, I think, it must be really uh, amazing to be part of it. So, uh, can you also talk a little bit about Circlo and the kind of work that you do, do at the company? Uh, what kind of approaches do you follow? Yeah. Well, uh, in Circlo, we, at the beginning, we, we are looking for make social innovation uh, projects, but in, it was very hard to sell social innovation into corporation and integrate it with... Um, with um, Mexico's context. So we paused that idea and started doing a strategic design uh, projects and service design projects. And after like four years, we um, um, start doing again social innovation projects. And it's very interesting. We are doing social innovation pro projects around education, about, around a circular economy, about uh, integrating smaller uh, producers into a bigger uh, supply chains, for example. So I think since um, the, the last four years, we are really, really sure about how 
uh, design methodologies and service design methodologies and strategic design methodologies, how can we can integrate them into social impact world? So um, this is more or less the adventure. I don't know, Lorenza, if you have more info about <laughs> this. Uh, so I had just like one follow-up question, maybe either of you take it up. Um, Lucy, you mentioned that uh, considering the Mexican situation and the scenario landscape, uh, it was hard for you to sell uh, social innovation to corporates. So according to both of your experiences, um, can you give us a little more background in terms of how the landscape of innovation lies right now in Mexico? How has been your experience like working with corporations? Uh, and what are the challenges that you face uh, in convincing them to invest for uh, social innovation projects or like service design projects, circularity. So these are like all the important stuff that we are discussing and about. So how has been your experience uh, in venturing into that landscape and how does that look like in Mexico? Okay, that's a really good question. Well, we're seeing constant growth of companies entering into the landscape, as well as companies integrating service design with the, within their practice. Uh, there's a growing design community which is working together and building strong connections to reinforce design's value and share best practices, for example, like um, Service Design Mexico, it's, it's a big community right now. Um, and companies at the beginning we're only looking for design thinking workshops and something very, very simple and very small. And now I think they are recognizing the value of strategic design and design as a tool for innovating and creating sustainable value, purpose and impact. And they are realizing the, the impact into the business um, side of their uh, corporations. And for the future, we first, it, it's very uh, especially important that, that now we are seeing design and innovation has a voice and a place into these organizations. We believe the next step will, uh, is to implement um, a social impactful strategy in the core at, at every organization. Social impact, um, I think it's very important, especially in this context that is changing very fast. Uh, for example, circular economy, uh, sustainable development goals, and things like that. Uh, we think it's the future and, and the next step for, for us and for the design um, landscape. And I don't know if Lorenza have a, another point for this. Uh, what about you, Lorenza? Do you have any other uh, point to add or any other experiences? I think from... Um, um, my perspective shifting words from business to a more design and consultancy that we're looking um, a lot of business are accepting a lot of the language and a lot of the terms and a lot of the met methodologies that in the beginning were left only for certain industries or only for the creative part and now we're um, we're seeing a lot of industries in Mexico asking for that creativity and asking for designers and asking for uh, they, they, they um, mention it as these new crazy ideas or these um, design ways of doing things, right? The, the wicked ways of design. And I think that, that that has really changed the whole business context in Mexico because um, once big corporations are starting to um, implementing design ways and having their own design teams within their company, not only doing aesthetic or uh, websites, for an example, um, now that they're doing strategy as well, where they're doing research and they're um, informing the whole process of innovating and research and development, um, that has in a way like permeate, permeated into the whole business ecosystem. And that uh, fortunately for us and for Circular's Purpose, it has also kind of jumped into the the social atmosphere with where they're accepting it as well and they're getting the funds to do projects that have design um, within their core so that for us has been um, really good um, and as Lucy said we're we're still waiting and there's a lot of challenges still um, you know with that we need to to surpass in many ways but um, we're we're seeing more and more um, businesses and organization and international agencies talking our language and asking for service design, strategic design in different 
areas of their companies. Yeah, I think what you pointed out, both of you, is I think very, very important, which resonates a lot with even Indian context, uh, because we also struggle at the similar level to convince the corporations to uh, think about strategies and think about service design incorporating into their uh, way of working. Uh, so how has been your experience like in working with these uh, Mexican companies? Because you said that these big size, large size companies, once they start working with this, other corporations can get influenced because of that. Uh, but we were also having a conversation with uh, Gabriela Salinas, who, was, who is a founder of Service Design Mexico. So she also pointed out that uh, the similar kind of struggle where she focuses time in educating the clients or educating designers in this field. Uh, so her point of view was also that all the case studies that you see globally are most of the times European or uh, American. So how do you make sure, what is your first step, step that you take to convince these big corporations uh, if the already available material online is not always relevant to your context? Lori, I don't know if you want to, to start, but... Um, sure. I think um, something that we say in Circlo is um, one organization at a time, one client at a time. So um, for us, I think the strongest uh, way that we can uh, not necessarily convince, but um, make people part of our team, in a sense, is um, really collaborating with them. We yeah. always try to involve our customers and our clients in as many as activities as we can within our process. So mm -hmm. we're not um, traditional consultancy in a way that our client tells us what they need and we come at the end with the deliverable. We try to involve them in as, in as much in the process as possible so they can really see what the process is about and what, they, what we're really doing. And when they, when they see the and they actually experience a design methodology and a process firsthand when they go out and do primary research and they sit next to us in an interview, which is on site on the place where clients, where their clients live, they slowly become advocates for design as well. So for us, that has been um, the best way to do it. And then they, within their organization, they become champions of design. And they slowly, you know, um, talk about it and they, um, it's like a, like a seed they plant within their organization that slowly starts to grow. And more and more, their own team uh, asks more questions, wants to be more involved. They want to be more, uh, do more projects with us. And that, that is something that we've done. And um, uh, Lucy, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, for example, um we have a client and we start doing research for, for the innovation team, but for, for the marketing team, actually. And after like six months, they, they start realizing how important it is to listen to their customers, to go to, to the field and really put in customer shoes. And now um, they are implementing open innovation strategies into their organization. And for us, it's very important and um, very inspiring to see our clients have actually a voice around innovation and strategy into their organization. But uh, I think the, the switch uh, start when they go and see the process with us and, and learn with us. Uh, and for us, we, we say in circular that we, not, we are not looking for transactional relationship, but with uh, some more um, deep relationship with our clients. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, very interesting uh, and important. I'm sure there is a lot of uh, hard work that goes outside the actual scope of the work. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm sure it's it's need of the hour. So we'll will it's important to hope that uh, the seed is getting planted at different organizations so it grows uh, very soon. Uh, I have one like a follow-up question to Lorenza. If I have the correct information, you have also uh, studied and worked in the US and Germany. Uh, so when you compare those experiences to your experience in the Mexican industry, uh, do you see any difference? Uh, and how do you see uh, what kind of different experiences that you have had? 
uh, in different markets. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, interesting question because also my work, my international work um, was different from, from design. However, when you learn what design can do, you realize you've been doing design every time you work or everywhere you, where you work. Um, so I think the biggest difference is how, at least in Latin America, we're a couple of years behind. So in the US, when we're talking about um, design, innovation, and the process and the methodologies that go behind um, these disciplines, they're five or 10 years ahead of what's going on in Mexico. So you don't need to convince as many people. You don't need to go and talk to so many stakeholders. And the process, in a way, goes smoothly in, in those ways. And uh, also, the audience is also more accustomed to this to this work, to these processes, um, to this type of um, even research. And um, in Mexico, um, it's kind of um, doing a couple of steps back and, and start um, where probably these countries were a couple of years ago. But it's also an opportunity to do things right from the beginning. Yeah. Because um, we all know that you know design uh, can have unwanted consequences or could have certain things that were not necessarily planned um, for the out outcome that you wanted. So for us now in Circula, that's um, besides that it aligns with the value as a company and with the purpose that we have, uh, being able to be at this moment in time where design, uh, service design, strategic design, innovation is um, starting to have its boom, uh, for us it's, an, uh, it's a perfect opportunity to do it right, to do it for the for the right reasons, to do it in ways that it has a real sustainable impact that our stakeholders not necessarily end with it within our clients and our clients' clients, but also go beyond uh, their communities, their societies, and uh, nature, you know, even where uh, the environmental context which within which we are. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really uh, nice and positive way of looking at it, that how can you do things right from the beginning. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it's super important thought. Um, so when you talk about the environmental impact or the sustainable impact or the kind of social innovation work that you have done, uh, uh, both of you maybe under uh, your company or maybe before that, uh, can you talk about how uh, do you uh, work with the human-centered design and also use behavioral sciences with that uh, to achieve impacts? Uh, it would be great if you can just illustrate that maybe with a case or some one example of any of your project. Sure. Um, and specifically for us, um, this year we, we have focused a lot on our behavioral science approach to um, our saying also comes from the, from the Duke Laboratory that says, um, our purpose is to make people healthier, wealthier, and happier. So um, uh, it goes more into um, to well-being and to making our, our purpose and our projects really impact their quality of life. So um, for us in terms of project, um, one has been around finance and uh, uh, making people have a healthier finance life and how that impacts the rest of their lives. Um, when people in Mexico, as in many countries, I, I, I presume... There's a lot of, you know, the credit card debt and how people, you know, um, once they start that journey, it looks like it's, a, it's spiraling down to a tunnel. So we are helping um, by using behavioral science, merge with uh, the design methodologies that we have, um, how to make them uh, learn how to save money in a healthier way so they can pay their debt. And that has a ripple effect into their lives, into their quality of life, into their families and uh, how how they manage whatever comes after this this intervention in a way, and um, we are we're also applying it into um, into the very interesting topic of making uh, inclusive insurance, which is a big topic globally. And uh, you know there there's so many challenges around that industry that doesn't necessarily uh, just live within its industry, like it's political, it's, uh, it has to do with um, social norms, culture, so many other things. But um, using uh, a behavioral science lens, we're able to identify 
uh, barriers, behavioral barriers that could be easily eliminated or reduced um, which we, with the tools and the, and the process that we use. And it's very interesting to see how, how sometimes we believe uh, a problem is very rooted in something that has, you have to change so many things. And just a tiny intervention to the context where the decision is taking place can make a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, I think using behavioral science with design and methodologies is like mixing a very qualitative focus and a very scientific focus to have um, better solutions. And for us, this is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, take a one minute. Just I just wanted to tell the participants if anyone has any questions for both of them, it'll be great if you can just type it into the chat window. Uh, so we can start taking uh, questions as well. Um, so meantime, I wanted to ask uh, one question. Uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion within the company on online on all the social media platforms. Uh, but what do you think? Uh, especially talking about the Mexican uh, landscape, what impact of the COVID-19 do you see right now happening in the industry that you are working? And after, uh, say, six months down the line, what do you see uh, changes taking place uh, in the industry? Yeah, well, COVID has shown us that for some of organizations that don't know yet the power of design, um, they are dismissing the idea of implementing or using it as a resilience tool. But for in, in other um, phase, the organizations that have been exposed to service design and innovation tools or any other methodology and have seen the impact, they are using these kind of tools like um, using to adapt, the, uh, adapt, adapt their organization in face of COVID, uh, eliminating traditional approaches that are not longer okay with this new normal, and reframing the value proposition that, that we think it's very important right now to rethink how, how they are doing business and how they are approaching to their users and clients. Um, other thing that it's, I think it's very important is um, they use design tools to rap rapidly uh, shifting into a digital context, for example, and listening better to their clients and communities around um, their offer. Mm -hmm. I think these points, I don't know, Lorenza, if you have any other? Mm. Yeah, I think um, questioning one of the, uh, answering one of the questions on the chat, um, I think also in the face of COVID um, really applies, how do we conduct re research during this context, right? Um, and it has been also challenging and we've been learning and adapting as well, thanks to, to doing all these design methodologies within our clients, we can also apply it to us. And I think um, the first step for us was stop being afraid of digital um, use for research, right? Besides, you know, the Google research or some, or the typical way that we use technology for, it's like, okay, how can we really um, do an interview like this? Is it the same? Is it, what's what's the difference? Like, what what are we gaining when we do a a video interview? What are the things that we lose? What about um, you know um, corporal language or um, how about all the cues that we don't see and we don't we can't go to to the people's houses, so what do we do? And I think it's, um, for us, it's always having those things in mind when we do it. The projects that we're doing now during COVID have that, you know, asterisk at the end that there's like, this research was conducted during this time. It's a typical, yeah. it's uncertain. We don't know if it's gonna be the same in, in a year from now. So remembering that, that it's, um, we're living this globally. And also it's, um, reframing certain tools that were very easy to use digitally, like surveys, and, and thinking them in how can we now make surveys work for us better? Can we do surveys that instead of having so many questions can have images? 
Can we have a um, service that can uh, lead clients to see a video and interact with the video? So that gives more information. So it's kind of like exploring the tools that we had physically. How can we adapt them into a digital context, um, but as, accept them as digital tools? Because we don't really want to you know, um, confuse them or try to um, analyze them as if they were uh, physical. But having also that thing in mind is really important for us. I mean, I, and I don't, I don't think we have um, the complete answer to that question. It's just how we're doing it and we're still learning from it. So um, if any of you also have a way that has worked for us, please share. Because I think for all of us researchers out there, learning how to do research like this is, has been a real challenge. Yeah. For example, we use uh, WhatsApp for uh, rapid prototyping. So we create uh, these little, little videos and we send through WhatsApp to our users and they uh, answer us through emojis. And I don't know, I think it's uh, using creativity and losing the fear of uh, failing also. Yeah, yeah, I think it's super interesting also and I'm sure it's really uh, challenging and interesting times at the same time for all of us to figure out uh, different tools to do the same activity or maybe a completely different activity to achieve the same goal. Uh, so I'm sure it's super uh, interesting time. So just a quick follow-up before we take the next question. Uh, is there something from behavioral sciences that you think we can learn uh, as a mindset, as a tool to actually cope up with this new situation of conducting research in this new context and maybe empathize better with our users? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned that has really shifted our minds in the way we approach people is that um, uh, Daniel Kahneman, which uh, wrote Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, um, makes this statement that we have two systems which function in our brain, system one and system two. System one is impulsive, it's hot, it's the one that we use all the time. It's the one that responds quickly and it's the one that makes us survive because if we're thinking all the time profoundly, we couldn't go with our every day. And system two is our, our reasonable, our ra uh, rational, the one that really thinks like, if I, if I ask how much is 200 plus 245, right? Um, so for us, um, knowing that 90 to 95 or our, of our daily cognition is made by system one made us realize like how can we design and how can we um, do use tools that um, are um, targeted to system one and not system two because if we make our clients our users our non organizations go into that system it's going to be really hard and it's going to add so much more uh, pressure and depletion to what's already going on outside or doing this world. So I think um, um, one of our, um, I mean, a good tip that I could do is like learn, you know, heuristics and bias that we have as humans. We all have them. They, um, they're all around us all the time and um, be empathetic about that. So in a way, if you know that we are social people, we're social beings, um, by nature, right? How can we then design things that are easier in that way that are now, um, that are not, not an extra pressure or burden into these uncertain times? Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be, you know, one. Um, the other one is um, trying to, um, to look at behavior as, as something that is very um, natural <laughs> um, in a way that we, when we, when we behave, sometimes we think that we are making all of these decisions and making uh, complex decisions. And most of the times we're not. Most of the times we're, we're picking the first thing that we see. Uh, we, we, not, we do not necessarily pick a new thing, right? Um, yesterday I was talking with, um, with some people and uh, we talked about this, this behavioral principle that is called decision paralysis. So when we're faced with uh, many decisions, people will make the simpler decision or they won't make a decision at all, right? So, um, and um, 
the study that goes behind that, which is a, a very fun study, says that they did an experiment in the U.S. with two different grocery stores, where in one they put a um, like a jam stand with different with six different flavors, and um, they wanted to know how many people came and tried this jelly and how many people actually buy it. And on the different store, it was uh, 36 flavors and 36 different um, jelly flavors. And also wanted to know how many people approach the stand to try, to try it and how many actually buy it. And at the end, um, I mean, you, you guys can guess through the chat what happened and which one worked best. Uh, but because of time, I think I'm going to go fast and tell you what happened. Um, so they, they found that people um, come to try it and approach the stand that has the most flavors. When we are offer many flavors, we want to see what it is, you know. We, you know? But when um, the actual moment of purchase came, people that only had the six flavors bought more. So um, the, the perfect examples in our lives is um, Netflix, right? Uh, <laughs> how many of us have went to, into Netflix and you're like, oh, what I want to see, a, a new movie. Today I want to see something new. And after like three or five minutes of browsing, you're like, no, I end up seeing the, the same movie that you always see or completely shutting it off and doing a completely different activity, right? Um, for me personally, uh, my, my worst um, decision paralysis in, is in restaurants that have big menus when they have more than 50 options for me is, you know, crazy. Like there's so many, just tell me what to pick. Right. Yeah. And um, so when we learn these different bias and these different uh, behavior principles, that's what their, their name, um, you start to realize that there are certain things that apply to all of us, no matter where we're from or no matter what age we are. And um, you start taking that into account of your, of your process and the design that you're making, and it helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's super interesting topic. I'm sure we can talk for like really long on the, the, uh, the paralysis because of the excessive choices. There is one really interesting question. I am not sure if we can cover that in like two minutes, but I'm just going to quickly read up. Uh, so uh, he wants to know quickly uh, the selling of service design or strategy, strategy design as a methodology for new clients. Uh, I have experienced that clients, once they experience it firsthand, they become advocates, but that very first interaction is tricky. So do you have any tricks uh, that has worked for you? I think speaking um, business language is very important. And I don't know, instead of uh, telling clients, ah, let's go and make some uh, co-creation and things that uh, at, at first um, are very complex to them, we, we simplify that language so they can really, really understand uh, the value of these, um, these processes. Um, and talking about results, how implementing design strategies will um, affect in a, in a good way their business. I, I think this is very important. And I don't know, Lorenza, do you have any other points? I think that's very important. I would maybe only add something that we use a lot that we quick wins. Mm -hmm. How can you make a, a, real, a quick win with your clients fast? Um, so in a way, if you're going to do a big process and you're going to, you know, sell this idea of service design, can you do uh, a tiny design thinking workshop in two hours where you co-create, you know, sometimes a service blueprint, a fast service, service blueprint is such a powerful tool for people that have never been exposed to design and they realize that it, all it's connected that, you know, um, having a way to visualize their business in a service blueprint blows their mind. So. Um, yeah. There are tiny tricks like that that can work really well. Yeah, that's super, super interesting. We really have, like, I think few seconds left. So I really, really want to thank both of you and all the participants for joining in uh, and having, uh, asking like really great questions. So thanks a lot. Uh, this has been great chatting with you and the, the topics that you discussed, it's super interesting. So hope we get another time to yeah. chat it like longer length.